fact, gun deaths in this country have reached new heights. And most reasonable people want illegal guns off the streets. The question is, how? We need people who are working for solutions, not just taking advantage of problems. Preach! It's not my idea. Those are the words and actions of Asiya Tamimi, okay? She has a plan that is a function of her putting purpose to pain. What pain? All three of her sons have been shot in the past eight years. She is a mother, but she is not anti-gun. She's a former corrections officer. She is a firearms instructor and a licensed bounty hunter. And she's now working with a program she started in her hometown of Washington, D.C. to prevent gun violence. Asiya, thank you so much for thank joining us. Thank you for us. having me. Now, I appreciate you and I appreciate what you're doing. And mm -hmm. I was wowed mm -hmm. by your having the strength to put purpose to pain. How do you handle having three sons shot, one paralyzed, mm -hmm. in eight years? How do you endure? Faith. My relationship with God. That's what has gotten me through. And also support of good, you know, friends and family. You know. Um, How do you make sense of it? I mean, really, I don't. It's, it's um, something I wouldn't wish on anybody. You know, the call you get uh, that your child has been shot, it's like everything is in slow motion. I've gone through this three times. My first son, uh, my oldest son, he was shot getting out of the car in a cross by, I mean, a crossfire, and he was caught in the middle. Um, my middle son, he was walking to the store. I was in the Bahamas with my husband uh, on a vacation, well-deserved, finally, and... I went to go to the, where they had the computer set up for Facebook mm -hmm. and looked online and saw where everybody was on his dad's page saying, praying for your son. And I'm like, wait a minute. So I called home, phone bill was like $1,000, but I, I had to find out what was going on with my son. Um, he was shot in the stomach. My youngest son. Oh, wait a minute, and the, the son who was shot in the stomach, uh -huh. thank God, survived. He didn't call you because he didn't want to worry you because he knew the pain you felt from the first son shooting. Yep. My, his, his dad didn't want to call me because they knew I had already gone through something with his shooting. Um, but when I got the word, it was like vacation over. I want to get home. Um, I was told that he stopped breathing on the table, but they were able to resuscitate him. And then last year, my husband was, um, he had, he, it's an elderly guy he knew, who was being attacked by a younger guy. And so he asked him, he said, Pops, are you okay? And the guy said, well, what is it to you? So my husband was like, I'm just trying to check on him and make sure he's okay. So the guy came over and started attacking my husband. My husband got the best of him. They fought. He pulled out a knife and stabbed him in the chest and killed him. Six weeks later, my youngest son, two days after his birthday, he was in Mer out in Merlin. He knows nobody out in Merlin. We, through investigations, we know that it was, it was an attempted robbery. Um, he was going to his car, and somebody came up behind him, shot my son twice in the back of the head. Two days after his 26th birthday, shot him in his spine, one bullet a centimeter from his heart, one in his lung twice in his legs. They had to repair his esophagus. I mean, it's just been, and thank God, it hasn't affected his, his senses, like his memory, his eyesight, or anything like that. He's an artist, you know? We talked before the show. Yeah, he loves you. And he's so proud. <laughs> he's so proud of what you're doing. Now, let's, let's clear up some misconceptions, because, you, mm -hmm. you know, I can feel how certain things will be interpreted. First is, somebody hears that one family is affected this much, the temptation is to put it on the family. What is the reality of you're not having the choice of whether or not to participate in the violence in a community like the one adjacent to where you are? It's, it, it you can, one thing about being in D.C., D.C. Is a, is a small city. It's only like 20 something miles radius. Um, I've seen families where 
the mother has lost all three of her sons. And they're not gangbangers. They're not gangbangers. They weren't out trying to pull off no. a caper and the cops no. kill them. This is just by being we're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yep, that's what it is. And the reaction of most people would be, I never want to see a gun. I don't want them anywhere. They are the devil's tools. Mm -hmm. Not you. You mm -hmm. are a licensed bounty hunter. Mm -hmm. You are a firearms instructor. Mm -hmm. And you are absolutely, therefore, pro-gun. Mm -hmm. But you say this is not inconsistent with your goal, which is getting illegal firearms off the street. Explain. I think that you have a lot of military weapons on the street that should not be. You have a lot of guns in the hands of juveniles. Definitely shouldn't be. I think that anybody that has a firearm should have gone through safety classes, courses. You need to know how to unload a gun, how to load a gun, how to clean a gun properly. You're a certified a instructor, I'm, by the way. I'm a certified safety instructor for law enforcement through National Rifle Association. Um, I was certified in Divine, Texas through my employer, which was the prison. And you are not um, against people having weapons. Why? Because I think that it's, it's a Second Amendment right that they should, you know, if they want to have a firearm, they should be able to have a firearm. I've seen too many innocent people murdered and slaughtered in D.C. For what? I mean, I think you should be able to protect yourself, you know? And what is the secret that you found? So you're working in a prison. Mm -hmm. You start talking to some of the inmates. And you start to hear a theme often enough that it sparks an idea in your mind that, this is how I can keep guns out of the hands of people who are desperate to do something with their life. What did you discover? What did you do about it? Well, for one, I would work in R&D sometimes, which is receiving and discharge. And I would see them come to line the inmates up and take them to court. They would drag the chains, and it just made me think of slavery. And as we know, you know, slavery is abolished by, for all those except those that are convicted of a felony. So I said, no, this is not a job for me. I, I, I can't do this any longer. But what I did is went back up to my unit. I had an inmate. He was getting ready to leave. And he said, you know, I'm going home in two weeks. I said, well, do me a favor. Don't come back. This is a revolving door for many. And he said, can I speak to you after, you know, you step everybody in? I said, sure. So I got my detail out, let him come out. And I said, what's going on? He said, I don't want to come back to prison. I said, well, what's the problem? He said, I'm illiterate. And I said, what do you mean, like, you have difficulty with reading? He said, no, I'm totally illiterate. And I've been passing through society, making people think that I can read and write. But I have a two-year-old son. I don't want to go back to jail. So I got off work that day. I went and found. I knew we have a lot of programs in D.C., a lot of them. But it's a matter of getting those programs out to the people who need them. And so I went and got the... Uh, some literature for him on literacy programs. And I said, when you get out, have somebody call these people or you call them and tell them you want to get into a literacy program. I saw him two years later. He said, I looked everywhere for you. I wanted to thank you. What's he doing now? He's working construction. He said, I don't even want to look back at that. It's just, just a lesson not to go back there. And now you have the program. What's it called? It's called Rock Now. Rehabilitating our community is key now. ROC. N-O-W. R-O-C-K. N-O-W. And yes. people can go and they can donate. It's a 501c3. Yes, it's a 501c3. You know, I have the Chris Cuomo Project, the podcast. We sell the free agent merch so we okay. can raise money to give it. You're going to get a donation for Aww, us so you can continue the work. Thank you. Now, listen, don't thank me. You're doing the work. Mm -hmm. You've lived where you owe nobody anything. Yes. Uh, for you to give back in the way that you're doing will make a difference. And you're helping people avoid the violence of the streets. Yes. And I appreciate you, and I, I wish you the best with your family. Thank you so much. I'm so much. sorry for the loss of your husband. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And to Mimi, uh, see you to Mimi. <laughs> uh, you can go. You can donate. We'll put it on the screen. I'll put it on my social media, and we'll help somebody make a difference. Thank you so much. God bless and be well. God bless you, too.